All right, next up, our next speaker, as Maria alluded to, is Dr. James Green, NASA's chief scientist. And he's gonna to talk to us about ingenuity briefly and the future of flying on Mars. Uh, and so James, I'm handing it over to you and thank you for being with us today. Oh, my very great pleasure. Uh, let's uh, do a quick check. Can you see my charts? Yes. All right, super. Well, it's just a delight to be here. Uh, to uh, give you a short update on what's happening with ingenuity, but also take time to think about the future. What could be next now that we've accomplished an enormous feat and flying on the red planet, the first off earth flight ever, all right? So what we have, of course, is um, landing, with curiosity, uh, pardon me, with perseverance. It, we go through the, the, uh, the, the crazy entry, descent, and landing with Sky Crane actually sitting it down on the surface, much like we did with Curiosity. That worked, of course, incredibly well. Uh, although um, perseverance looks very much like Curiosity, it is really quite different in all the instrumentation that it's doing with some similarities with many cameras uh, and a new function and that indeed is to core rock. Uh, these cores are uh, about the size of a chalkboard chalk and for those uh, younger uh, audience uh, members uh, who don't know what a chalkboard chalk is, uh, we'll, we'll say like a large Crayola crayon. And so these, um, these cores, a uh, few inches long, three to four inches long, and uh, a, a, a beautiful diameter then are uh, broken off and then pulled out of the rock and then stuck in containers, which then are dropped or will be dropped in a collection after interrogation in, uh, of, of certain areas. We have an, a, a large number of tubes on board uh, where we can take samples. We have uh, 43 sample tubes and we've actually uh, taken three samples so far. Uh, two uh, rock samples and one atmospheric sample. Now, of course, Perseverance Rover is a fabulous mission because it's understanding a lot about the evolution of Mars geologically, you know, is the history book as you core rock and look back into time on what's happened to Mars. We know Mars was a blue planet. It was uh, like Earth uh, on the order of 4 billion years ago with vast oceans, a lot of water on the surface, and it went through rapid climate change. And hopefully the rock record will give us some hints as to when that occurred and how it may have occurred. But also within the rock record is, is potentially uh, evidence for ancient life, ancient microbial life. You know, there's 5,400 minerals or so here on Earth, and 350 of them or so can only be made by life. So indeed, that rock record may indeed contain uh, certain minerals for which uh, uh, ancient microbial life on, on the planet may have contributed to. So it's a fabulous mission that not only tells us that, a lot about that history, but goes after some potential life uh, elements that have been um, or would have been uh, deposited in the rock record. And that comes from returning those samples back to Earth where we can study them in, in, intently. And we also have a variety of instruments on board that help feed forward uh, in, uh, in the area of uh, human exploration. And one of them, I think, is really uh, ingenuity. Uh, the concept, of course, is that those samples will be uh, picked up by a fetch rover, brought over to a new system that will have been landed, which has a Mars ascent vehicle. Uh, then that uh, vehicle will be erected once it has acquired all the samples lofted. And then uh, a spacecraft built by the European Space Agency will capture it, hunt it down in orbit, capture it, and then return those samples to Earth for indeed intense analysis and investigation. 
Uh, we hope to be able to uh, uh, start this whole process of returning the samples and getting them back to Earth by late this decade or early next decade. Well, now I want to concentrate, of course, on Ingenuity, the fabulous technology demonstration mission that had a ride with Perseverance. Here you see uh, one of the views of Ingenuity. Uh, we've dropped the belly pan. It's, it's, it hasn't been dropped to the surface yet. It hasn't unfolded. But indeed, when that has been done, sits on the surface, uh, uh, Perseverance then, seeing that everything was set, moved away about uh, 50 meters or so. And then that enabled us to indeed start a variety of testing uh, 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 flights, all right? So what really do we have in terms of ingenuity? Well, it's only about four pounds. And in that, we have packed a variety of things, uh, uh, several cameras, a downward looking camera, an outward looking camera, uh, altimeter, uh, 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 the batteries are such that they're charged up by solar panels. The avionics, of course, has to be self-contained in the sense that uh, it receives information from its antenna from Perseverance, which gives it the software commands necessary to perform all the flights. And uh, the antenna and uh, uh, Perseverance uh, capability is such that we believe it could communicate perhaps as far away as a kilometer uh, from, uh, from uh, Perseverance. Only about four pounds, all right? Now, for our flights, uh, we went through five major test flights. Here is a, a beautiful view uh, of our third flight. Uh, this is uh, an L maneuver where we moved up, uh, then moved off to the side, uh, uh, almost as much as uh, 50 meters or so, and then returned to the spot where we were, where we've initially lifted off. Now, indeed, uh, uh, this is our first flight on another planet. Uh, this is a fabulous step forward. You know, we you, you, all the testing aside, you really don't know how it's going to work until it actually is on the planet. And indeed, it worked spectacularly well. Uh, what we see, of course, is um, um, the demonstration flights were the first five. Uh, it went through that uh, uh, period very well. Each of the flights had an increase in complexity, whether it was straight up down and then straight up L, uh, and, then, and then jumping to a new landing site. And it pushed the limits not only of height, the ability to leave the surface uh, got up to 10 meters, which is pretty astounding, uh, but also in distance. Uh, you know, the, the fourth flight was uh, 271 meters total distance, but also in flight time. You know, so we gradually increased the flight time, really putting it through its tests. At the end of the five flights, it performed so well and it impressed not only uh, uh, the, the world and what it could do, but more importantly, the per perseverance teams, science teams, who really felt that it could be used as part of an operational scenario with perseverance. What could it do? Well, it could look uh, for hazards, also special formations. So rover path planning could be facilitated by data from indeed uh, Ingenuity flights. And we find out we can take high resolution data uh, from Ingenuity and compare it with some of our other observations, in particular from uh, uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter's high-rise instrument. So uh, next, let's see if I can, there we go. Here is a great example of that image comparison. So on um, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, we see on the left panel, uh, indeed, a total image you know, where that resolution is on the order of a little less than a, a, about three quarters of a meter per pixel. 
and then splotched right through the middle of it is a series of images uh, from Ingenuity. And we've blown that up on the right side and we can see the Ingenuity image in far greater detail. And of course that enables us to make comparisons with high rise and understand much more with this ground truth of the hazards, but also the exciting geological form formations that me, we may want to uh, uh, visit. Now here, after the first several flights, we really took off and went over area that had variations in height. You know, this is uh, uh, flight nine, you're watching flight nine, you're seeing the drifting and accumulation of the dunes. Uh, this height variation was very important to fly over to ensure that uh, uh, we could accommodate that through the altimeter measurements as it, as it then makes decisions on board. Uh, absolutely a spectacular flight. Uh, the 10th flight was also unbelievably exciting in the sense that uh, we could take off. You see then as we uh, move towards the uh, these raised ridges, we actually made maneuvers, nearly a right angle turn, uh, you know, took uh, many images along the way as you're seeing this path and then followed that ridge back up and then moved, of course, uh, to a new uh, landing site. So really spectacular set of, uh, of uh, runs. These flights are, are, as we mentioned, even more complicated than the test flights, and it's performing in a superb manner. Uh, the next thing is uh, uh, one thing that was discussed, I'll mention it here, uh, because I was very much involved in that discussion early on, is uh, if we had Ingenuity uh, on the mission prior to launch, could it pick up the samples? This was a very intriguing idea, but because of course, it was a technology demonstration capability, we decided that it, for, for uh, absolute ensuring the best possible uh, capability for uh, ingenuity, we would limit it only to uh, ensuring that we could fly on the surface of Mars, testing the limits of that flight, and, and then think about, of course, what would be that future? What else could it possibly do? So indeed, uh, Ingenuity doesn't have the ability to pick up these samples that are laid down, but potentially future opportunities in terms of retrieving material from future helicopters and then bringing that back to a certain location or a base will be extremely important. Now, uh, as we move towards going to Mars, the current concept is that we're going to define an exploration zone, a location on Mars that is about 200 kilometers in diameter, uh, for which we'll land in one spot, we'll live in another spot, there'll be great opportunities for in situ resource utilization, and important to the scientists, really intriguing areas to study. And 200 kilometers is really, of course, uh, quite an enormous distance. So we anticipate that indeed, not only will humans have robotic vehicles in terms of rovers uh, with them, but they can indeed have uh, uh, helicopters with them. So Ingenuity, as I mentioned, was a four pound system, but we believe we can scale it up. Uh, perhaps by as much as a factor of 10. So a 40 pound helicopter can be a significant and have a significant advantage in terms of exploring uh, Mars in new and important ways. Well, this idea is not new. Before we even launched Perseverance, uh, many of us in NASA worked with the National Geographic a group that were developing a, a series called Mars. And here's, an, here's a little movie that's out of that, that uh, uh, segment. Uh, here you see uh, uh, a controller. The controller is indeed getting ready 
to uh, uh, launch a whole variety of helicopters. And the key element that they're doing is indeed uh, looking for skylights, looking for collapsed lava tubes for which then the humans will move from a surface space down into a, uh, a lava tube area. And of course, what's exciting about the opportunity to find a lava tube, even on Mars today, where the future might be, the helicopter can go into a lava tube and interrogate it, making measurements of temperature and pressure, but also humidity and maybe even uh, microbial uh, uh, life could be detected in, in, or in these lava tubes much like we see it, of course, in caves here on Earth. Now, other things that uh, we're really excited about in terms of uh, uh, potential activities that helicopters could do is really illustrated in the reoccurring slope lineae. Okay, that's, a, <clears throat> that's shown in these four images. Uh, these are from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. There's uh, four distinct seasons. They're put on top of each other. And so we have summer, uh, fall, oh, sorry, we have, let me do this again. So here we, here we have in each of these a, a seasonal view. We have winter, spring, summer, and then fall. And so what they show you is these, uh, these lines, these streaks that emanate down crater walls. The very right side is the top of the crater, the very left side is the bottom of the crater and these uh, reoccurring slope lineae are there. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy over what they are. Are they really a, a briny water that where the sun is uh, uh, shining on the, on the uh, crater wall, perhaps sublimating a plug in an aquifer and then the water runs down in the uh, crater wall? Some indications are that indeed uh, spectral measurements have said that this is water, but indeed uh, uh, there are potentially uh, many of these uh, that are, could be a loose, loose material that, is, that has uh, once the sun hits it and the water that may be holding it together sublimates, then that material also rolls down the hill. To be able to determine that, a helicopter is really in the perfect position to be able to do that. Swoop down with high resolution imaging, spectral analysis, and even methane detection, you know, because some of these aquifers, which, which if indeed that's what they are, supplying water uh, flowing down these craters may contain life and signatures of methane would be incredibly important. A lot of the ancient river valleys could be explored, uh, literally going down one of these uh, areas, looking for potentially accumulations, uh, if there was life in these waterways of unusual rock formations, and based on what we may continue to find uh, with um, uh, Percy, in Gale Crater, sorry, in uh, uh, Yezero Crater, interrogating the delta, we may find other areas uh, in, in these rivers that are extremely important. Methane, of course, has been observed on Mars, not only directly uh, from our rovers, but even from our telescopic observations. We see that it peaks in the summer, but we really don't have a great spatial distribution idea on its surface uh, at high resolution uh, that we could do, of course, uh, from helicopters, you know, where, where we can create a pattern going back and forth, uh, looking over, making methane measurements, determining uh, whether there are certain times or even areas where methane is leaking through uh, more so than others. Uh, so these are fabulous opportunities to really uh, use these kind of systems uh, indeed to, uh, to be able to make really critical measurements. And then, of course, the ability to explore Mars in a rather unique way, really up close and personal. The ability to look at its terrain, the ability to see features 
We can't see at um, uh, even on the scale of what the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is that can alert us to the fact that we want to go back. Uh, this, of course, is um, a simulated uh, flight uh, using the Mars Trek system uh, going through Valles Marineris, a slice through it, uh, for which then we can examine the floor in great detail. We can perhaps even tease out what might be uh, important information to tell us if this is uh, an element of plate tectonics or based on the volcanic activity uh, uh, th that created this major valley system on Valles um, uh, Marineris on Mars. So just spectacular stuff. Well, I'm really out of time, uh, uh, but I just wanted to give you a few ideas that none of these ideas uh, currently uh, are um, moving towards flight. They're just considerations. They're just thoughts of elements that we can do based on the tremendous success that we have had, of course, with um, uh, ingenuity on Mars. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. I think we have a few questions and we'll hand it over to uh, Lara again, or um, I'm not sure, James, who's yeah, doing we'll, the Q&A? We'll do Lara for Jim, yeah, thank you. Hi, James, my name's Lara. Again, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions on behalf of the audience. Sure. Um, so the, First question comes from Omar, and Omar is asking, uh, hi, James, how has the MOXIE unit worked so far? Do you think we would be able to upscale it for human survival and fuel manufacturing? Well, I think it's been working absolutely spectacular. And, and indeed, you'll hear about that coming up. So I, I don't want to steal uh, Mike's thunder. Um, thank you. The next question is, um, Let's see. So the next question comes from Gary, and they're asking, whose idea was uh, was it to fly a drone on Mars? Or maybe if I can add, if you could just add a little bit about the mission team uh, behind, um, uh, yeah. behind, yeah, behind. The uh, uh, yeah, I was uh, at NASA headquarters, and I, I, I had a unique perspective as to what was going on. But indeed, uh, uh, as we were getting ready to release the announcement for instruments, on Perseverance, an international announcement. Uh, and of course we selected um, uh, many international instruments uh, to add to it. And that was coming up. Um, Charles Lachi called me. Uh, he was the director at uh, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Good friend of mine, you know, we interacted for many years and he said his team has come up with a spectacular idea. And of course, he wanted me to fund it. Okay, that was uh, uh, how our conversations typically went. And I said, Charles, what, what's the idea? And he goes, oh, we think we can fly on Mars. I said, that is an absolutely spectacular idea, but you have to propose it, all right? And indeed, uh, JPL did. Now, JPL also used their own internal money to move the whole idea forward uh, creating uh, uh, some of the information necessary for that proposal to be rated in a, in a way that we could actually select it. And indeed, although uh, our first announcement of the selected instruments did not contain ingenuity, uh, in discussions with uh, the selecting official, who was John Gronsfeld, uh, it was decided we could go ahead and then make that selection and move it forward. And indeed, uh, uh, that uh, really kicked off then an opportunity for me, once it's selected as head of planetary, to begin to fund JPL to continue the development, continue to go through the testing, demonstrating that uh, the helicopter could fly, in addition to, of course, uh, creating the design that would work. Uh, and it, uh, it just, um, uh, you know, my hat's off to JPL for really carving out this new area of investigation that we will reap enormous benefits uh, in, on, in, on the future, in the future. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. This is super fascinating. Uh, we've have, we have a lot of questions coming in, but I'll throw it to Outspace VR. They have one question for you. All right, VR away. Hello. Mm. Hi. It's great to know that uh, the new technology that we have just uh, bringing new ideas and new inventions. It does. Mm. And there is a quite a desire for scientists all of the in all fields that explore the another planet but re, uh, right now there's a bottleneck for the hardware and and the bringing uh, or labs or uh, on the planet and do the stuff over there so my question is oh, what's the bottleneck right now in robot technology over there is this hardware that uh, power or another text that needs to be improved or the software like machine learning to um, bring the intelligent and, and do the stuff uh, as quickly as possible. So that's my question about yes. how to. Yeah, great question. Improve. Now, because of the tremendous uh, concept of flying on another planet, uh, pioneered by ingenuity, uh, we also have selected a fabulous mission. It's a quadcopter called Dragonfly, and it will fly on and in the atmosphere, rather, of Titan. And Titan is a fabulous moon of uh, Saturn. Uh, it has atmospheric pressure twice that of the Earth's. And uh, indeed, it will uh, do an enormous amount of, uh, of interrogation of the atmosphere and be able to move to many different locations, uh, image and high resolution, et cetera. So what are the limitations in this area? Uh, well, of course, uh, Titan is very different from Mars. And so each and every one of these environments has to be engineered. Uh, uh, such that the system can function uh, and perform, you know, the required science activities that we have selected it to do. And so those are very different challenges. So a uh, Titan is incredibly cold, far colder on the surface and in the atmosphere than Mars is. And then, of course, uh, the atmosphere is much thicker uh, in addition to the fact that um, uh, there will be, uh, you know, humidity in that in the Titan atmosphere. It won't be uh, H2O. It'll be uh, methane and ethane in 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 vapor form, which then actually is uh, transports and literally rains out in the northern and southern hemispheres in the polar regions. So those environments have to be engineered, and they're both very different and very unique. And so consequently, they pre present themselves very differently in terms of the challenges that have to be overcome. So how the process typically goes is you, you make a decision on what, where you're going to go, how you're going to fly, what you're going to do with those types of capability and mobility, and then begin the process of engineering it. Uh, uh, because there are different distances, you know, more automation may be necessary for Dragonfly than for Ingenuity or even Ingenuity's uh, uh, follow-on missions uh, because of, uh, of, of the large distances. And then the ability that we communicate also helps or hinders the architecture of, of these systems. So all these things have to be re-engineered each and every time with new constraints and pose different problems in all those areas you mentioned. James, thank you. We are uh, out of time. It was delightful to have you and to learn about the future of flying on Mars. Very exciting. <laughs> Take care. Thank well, you. Well, I can't guarantee that's what we'll do. But if those <laughs> ideas stimulate our science community out there, I am delighted. But I think we can do each and every one of those and more. So okay. thank you so much for in inviting me to come and talk about the future of flying on the red planet. <laughs> Thanks, James. There'll be future invites. <laughs>